Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm the taper tonight, so... Hi, I'm Megan, and I'm very grateful, Illinois. Um, Megan. And um, I just want to say thank you because when I got here, I was running a little behind, and um, it's about you know ten five till seven. Latham and I are the only ones who walked in. I thought, okay, this is going to be a good group. So, <laughs> um, but thank you everybody for coming. Um, I um, I came into Illinois in August 25th, 2003, at the New Life Group in Tuscaloosa. Um, I was in college, and like we say, it was the last house on the block. Um, I um, I came in because I grew up, I was born into a family of alcoholism. Um, there was no getting away from it. It goes back generations. Um, apparently, learned recently, my grand, great-grandfather rode the rails drunk and stuff, so I think that qualifies. So, um, But the, the main reason I came in was my mom was alcoholic, and... Um, and I just couldn't, um, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, I had put all my hopes and dreams into her sobriety and, um, you know, you know the line, if you would only do, you know, what I say, then, you know, my life would be perfect. Yours would, you know, probably be okay too. Um, but, uh, and so, um, anyway, the, If any of y'all have grown up in alcoholism, you know it's like, I was very fortunate there was no violence. Um, I've heard some just absolute horror stories since I've come in here of, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, just all of that. And and so I'm just, I'm humbled because when I hear that kind of stuff, I think, I I really didn't have it that bad. And, you know, do I really need to be here? I'm like, oh, yeah, you obsess. So, yes, yes, you do. Um... So, um, anyway, um, my, um, growing up with my mom was, um, it was a mentality of us against the world. I'd always seen, like, my dad left, my, um, my stepdad, um, left, and I always thought, um, well, they'll leave you, but I never will, and I'll never give up on you, um, dying words, right? And, uh, so, um... But after 19 years, I finally, I was standing in the parking lot of a counselor's office, and I said, you know what, God, I give up. And I didn't know what I was doing right then, but that was the little door my higher power needed. And he was like, finally, okay, I can do something with this. Um, because I had, um, I'd fought it tooth and nail. I grew up in church, and I did what I thought I was supposed to do. I prayed for her, you know, I prayed for what I thought she needed. Um, you know, please God make my mom stop drinking. Um, and I always felt apart from and different than. And I want to, um, say that I'm very, very thankful to all, to all the AAs I've ever met and all the meeting, AA meetings I've gone to because, um, until I read the big book, that was the first time I'd heard, um, feeling apart from and not, you know, fitting in, and that's exactly how I felt my entire life. Um, school, church, it, it didn't matter, and um, I just, I never fit. Um, until the night I walked into Al-Anon, it, that was home. It was warm, it was um, inviting, and um, what was funny is, most of y'all know I have a little problem with time, and so I'm not always on time for stuff. And I was actually early for this, and um, the lady who I would ask to be my sponsor, she doesn't have a real good concept of time either, and she was early. So it was meant to be. Um, but I, rem- you know, I remember the room, I remember the people who were in it, um, and I just remember that it gave me nothing but love and acceptance, and that is Al-Anon for me. Um, and that's what I try to... Um, you know, to give to others, um, because I know that the world outside of here is very judgmental, and, um, you know, that's, if you've lived in this disease, at least I have, um, there's enough judgment in my head I don't need anymore, and, um, so it really takes these rooms for me to finally get to where, um, I can stop judging myself, and, um, I'm so grateful for y'all loving me until I could do that, because I couldn't when I came here, um, 
I thought I was perfect. Um, I wouldn't say that to you, but when I looked at the steps and looked at that fourth step, I'd, I'd grown up around AA. My mom been in and out and tried it a billion times, and so um, I knew, you know, I knew about the fourth step, and I knew the reason she couldn't get sober is because she wouldn't do her fourth step. She never got through it. So um, I also kind of looked at it. Um, well, I looked at it like, well, I really don't know what I'm going to put down. I mean, I. I didn't wreck any cars, I didn't steal any money, you know, what possibly could I have done to put on that sheet? Um, the answer is a lot, and I've done several of them, and there's always a lot. Um, but, uh, and I was going somewhere with that, anyway. Um, but the, um, oh yeah, the other part of it was, okay, well this is my chance to prove her wrong. If she can't get through the first step, I sure can. Um. And I've done so much stuff in my life out of spite. That was my motive. Um, you know, relationships. I stayed in way too long just because my family didn't like him. Um, it's like, I'll show you. And um, just, you know, scared my family to death over stuff. But um, I had to show them that I had my own life. And by God, you know, they didn't control me anymore. Um, but, uh, like I said, sick. Um so what I realized when I got here is that I'd been affected by the disease of alcoholism. It was in every every interaction I had ever had, every interaction I was going to have if I didn't do something about it. And um, and to be honest, this was the first place I was really loved. That was my biggest. Um, I think I wrote it in here. I've got a whole bunch of writing from when I came in, but. Um, yeah, three biggest fears, neglect, ab neglect, abandonment, and rejection. Um, and that that was exactly it. And I wanted to be loved. I wanted somebody to make me whole. Um, I tried with my mother, didn't work. I tried with, you know, my family's approval, didn't work. Um, you know, then it was on to relationships. And you can put a human in that hole, but they never fit because it's a God-sized hole. At least mine is. And... Um, but I would make them my everything. And um, if I wasn't so afraid of losing control, I might could um, be an alcoholic. Because that was one of my biggest fears growing up. I was so afraid I was going to be an alcoholic. And um, I fall asleep after two drinks. I don't think I have what it takes. So I'm, I'm not worried about that anymore. Um, but uh, I just... Um, I. There was no gray for me. It was always black and white. It was always just, um, you know, all or nothing. And um, and I was really hard on you, but I was even harder on myself. And um, to this day, I still have a bit of a problem with that, but I'm, I'm getting better. Um, I had a very nice message before I came in here that you can't do something perfectly. And I thought, that's perfect right before I walk into this. Um and as, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but um, I learned a long time ago that I just, I come up here, I, I pray, I do what I have to, and I, I turn it over. And so, whatever's supposed to come out will. So if I ramble, get mad at the big guy because I didn't do it. Um, but um, I, um, where was I going with that? You'd think he could keep a train of thought going, but I'm, I'm always crazy with, with talks. Um. Oh, um, just that I used to, you know, write it down and I'd rehearse what I was going to say during, you know, and none of the stuff I wanted to say would actually come out. And um, so finally I just gave up. I was like, okay, whatever. So I don't get nervous about talks until about five minutes. And I'm in the bathroom, I'm praying, and those butterflies start in my stomach. I'm like, I went all week, not cared. Now you're, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, so I... Uh, I don't have to tell y'all, you know, what it's like in living in active alcoholism. I'm sure everybody here knows. But um, anyway, I was, I was 18. Um, I'd been to, I'd left for college thinking, I give up. I can't do this anymore. Okay, I'll be happy when I get away from them. Um, and so a year in college, because I, I went to Tuscaloosa, and um, all of a sudden I'm not happy. And I didn't know why. I didn't realize I wasn't happy, but I was absolutely miserable. Um and I, um, it was a year, you know, I was in school year, I was about to go into my sophomore year, and I'd gone home for the summer, and my mom and I, um, if she wasn't drinking, we were, we would get along 
perfectly because, you know, I got what I wanted, except there was the thoughts of, oh, my God, what if she drinks again? Um, and so there's the eggshells. I don't want to make her drink, so I don't do I say or do this, and oh, it's just awful. And um, But when she was drinking, which she was sneaking around and drinking, and um, I, would, I would get just mean. I say there was no violence in my house. That's not true. Um, I never hurt. This just went blank. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I never hurt anybody, but um, I'm pretty sure slamming doors and throwing stuff out of anger is usually kind of classified as violence. And um, that was me. Um, she just wanted to drink and make the feelings go away, and she wanted me to leave her alone. But by God, I was miserable, and she had to be miserable too, so I had to poke her with stick. Metaphorically, um, but, you know, I just had, I, I had rehearsed the whole conversation in my head from the time I went to school to the time I came home, I was not wasting all that thought process on, you know, she wants to go to sleep. Um, no, 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 we were going to have that conversation because I knew a hundred scenarios of how it was going to go, and of course she picks the one I didn't come up with. Um, and I continued to do that over and over again. Um, so if that's not insanity, I don't know what is. Um, but we were... Um, We'd gone to counseling because we were having fights and we were fighting over important stuff like she didn't put the trash bag back in the trash after, you know, taking it out. And that's really important when you're, you know, at least for me, in the middle of it. And I was just like, Arr! um And so uh, I, I went to, um, we went to this counselor and I, I'm, I know today it was finally when I needed to hear it because for some reason, I went to al once before um, my stepdad recommended it and um and I thought to myself, what is he talking about? Al-Anon is for quitters. I am not done with this yet. She is just being difficult. I, I got this. Um, and so I actually went. I went to the stairway group in Decatur, and um, a friend of mine, he remembers me coming in where I sat, everything I wore, down, you know. And I just remember looking at the wall, those smoky walls, because they still smoked. They still do. But anyway, the... The steps and traditions were up there. And like I said, I've been around AA growing up. And um, I looked at them and I thought, well, they have the same steps and traditions as AA. That's weird. That's all I remember from that meeting. But I wasn't ready. Um, and so anyway, this um, the counselor, when we were sitting there, she asked us how we were and what was going on, what brought us there. And, you know, like a very mature adult, I pointed at my mother and I said, she's drinking again. And that's all I remember. Um, but uh, she... Um, she told me to go to Al-Anon, and she told my mom, I guess, to go to AA. But, um, and for some reason, I heard her, and um, she gave me instructions, and she was very specific. She's like, I want you to find a group before you go back to school, and I want you to find a group when you go back to school. Um, she goes, they're on the Internet and all that. So I went online, and I found, I found um, the Al-Anon groups, and, uh, and I'm so grateful that my higher power... Um, led me to the group I went to, because if y'all have ever been to Tuscaloosa groups, um, there's two of them that I know of, but there's a clubhouse that's a little bit shady, um, it's like any AA group I've been to most of the time, but um, those people were, as I would call them later, mean, and if I had had them my first night, I might have run and not come back, so I got the lovey, warmy, hug, huggy group, and I was very happy for that. Um, because they did. They just, they took me in, and they loved me, and they accepted me. Um, and, you know, I'm 19-year-old, 19 19-year-old 19 by this point, and, um, you know, all these people are old enough to be my parents, but for some reason that didn't matter. Um, and so, and we'd talk, and I'd ask questions, and, um, you know, I figured out I needed to get this thing called a sponsor, and, um, I, you know, I did all that. And I remember... Um, yeah, this is why I know my actual date I came in, because like all good little scholastic girls, I bought the book, because you got to buy the book if you're going to know the answers to the test, and so, and I've always written the dates and my name in my book, so I've got August 25th, 2003 in here, um, and so I started reading, and um, and I read everything I could get my hands on. I went to, you know, just all the meetings I could, and at that point, they only had two meetings a week, but... Um, I became committed to Al-Anon like I'd never committed to anything in my life. And um, and somebody said um, early on, you know, if it if it took you this many years to get sick, you know, how many years is it going to take you to 
um, get well. And, um, and I thought, okay. And I heard from the very start that this was a lifetime program. I didn't, from, I walked in there, you know, after the first night and I realized, okay, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. And I was okay with that. Um, because I was just, I was finally, I finally fit. And I always just wanted that piece of just fitting and belonging. Um, so anyway, I started that and then went through school. And once I graduated, well, um, during about a year and a half into the program, because I finally had some awareness about myself, I had finally started peeling away at all of that junk. And um, I realized I had a lot of self-hatred and um, just low self-esteem and just all the stuff that comes with growing up in alcoholism. And um, and I didn't realize it, but I had um, depression. And um, I'd seen my mom's bipolar as well. So I'd seen the sides of that. I'd seen all the doctor stuff, and I knew all that. And I was also a psychology major. And um, one night I was coming home from um, a friend's house, and I, I was driving behind my dorm, and it's on um, Warrior Rivers right there, so there's you know, the right on the river, and um, I remember looking over at the river, and I thought, what would happen if I just drove my car through this guardrail into the river? I was like, that'd be a perfectly good waste of a car. Now, looking back, that's a problem. Um, I was more worried about my car than a precious child of God dying, um, because I didn't, I didn't love myself, I didn't think I was worthy of anything, um, and um, my grandfather had bought me my car, and I really loved my grandfather, so, you know, he'd be upset about the car, not his granddaughter. Um, but I was, like I said, I was a psychology major, and so clearly I didn't do anything because here I am. Um, but that was an alarm bell to me to say something's wrong here. So um, I'm sitting in class, um, and for some reason the three psychology classes I had that um, – week, everything focused on, like, depression and bipolar and stuff, and they were listing symptoms. In the first class, I listed, and I was like, okay, I've got that, 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 and that. Next class, about the third class, I thought, okay, I need to ask for help at this point. Um, and so, anyway, um, I, um, I, I finally was able to ask for help, because that, y'all had taught me that, because when I came in, I don't know was not something I, I knew how to say. No was not in my vocabulary. And um, if I didn't know, you weren't going to find out. Because I had, I had to put on that front. I had to be, um, I had to know everything. And I had to be ready at a moment's notice to take, you know, you got to be ten steps ahead. Um, and so that's the way I'd lived my entire life. Um, so anyway, I asked for help, got, got all that and was taken care of. Um, and so when I came Came, I graduated. I took a I took a semester off school and came home and really that's when I got um, got into service. Um, I had uh, I went to um, Hartzell, which is um, one of my favorite groups in the whole wide world. Um, and that's the thing; it's really hard to pick a like a home group because I found they say you know if you don't think your home group's the best in the world, find another group. Well, I found like five that are just the best in the world, and you know. Um, there's a really good one in Istanbul, if any of y'all ever go, that's just fantastic. Um, they speak English. The one in Ankara speaks Turkish, but they're awesome too. Um, so, uh, anyway, I went and, um, I found another sponsor. Well, that group was really heavy in service. And I started going, um, uh, to, um to area with them. Um, I started going to districts meetings in area, and of course I didn't know what area was, and um, anyway, I, I went with them, and I found out, and I just, I never, I was in Model UN in college, and we did the whole Robert Rules of Order and all that, I never understood it. Um, for some reason, at area assembly, it clicked. I was like, oh, this is what it's about. I got it. Um, but uh, anyway, I started doing that, and I came back to my Tuscaloosa group, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we don't have a GR. We've got to have a GR. And they looked at me, and they are like, you can do it. I'm like, that's not what I was hinting at, but okay. Um, and uh, so I started going as the GR for them, and I was only there for a short time before I graduated. Um, but 
you know, I, I started getting active in service. And it's not just the GR level, but, you know, at the group level, chairing a meeting or um, setting up chairs or, you know, just welcoming newcomers, making sure they got a newcomer packet and they got a phone list in their hand. Um, they got somebody call at 3 in the morning. And um, I had somebody, I can't remember, um, I was talking to, a while back, and they were like, well, I really don't think, you know, al like AA where you can call somebody at 3 in the morning. I'm like, who told you that? I said, I've called people at 3 in the morning, and they've answered, and if they don't, I go to the next one. Um, I said, crisis happens at 3 in the morning, and thank God y'all didn't tell me, don't call me past 10 o'clock, because um, I, needed, I needed to be able to trust somebody, because I never, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been disappointed. Somebody, you know, my aunt's wonderful at this, but, um, oh, yeah, we're going to do this tomorrow, and, no, i got a bad hangover, I don't feel like it, or, you know, and for a kid, after a thousand times of that, you just don't trust anybody. Um, and so I really, I needed that. And uh, everybody who I've ever come in contact with al um, especially my sponsor, you know, when she says she's going to do something, she does it. Um, and y'all have also taught me that, we're human and we do make mistakes and sometimes you just can't answer the phone or you can't be there. Something happened, but it's not personal. Um, you know, you don't personally pick up, you don't look at your phone and say, oh, it's Megan. I don't want to talk to her and hang up. It has nothing to do with me. Um, and that's a gift. That's an absolute gift. Um, um, so anyway, um, started service and everything. And then um, a couple years ago, um, I... I've been going to area and for a while, and um, the new chairperson asked me to be the Love Express coordinator, which, if you don't know what that is, that's our area newsletter. Um, and I was scared to death because I didn't know anything about editing a newsletter. That was way beyond me. Um, I slightly forgot that was my sponsor's job. She actually does that for a company, and... Um, and so it's just, it's weird how stuff works out. But, you know, she helped me through it. A lot of people helped me through it. Um, I've also found in service you really start practicing that principles of pub personality things because, you know, um, people, we forget. We're human in Al-Anon, too. Um, but, you know, we forget sometimes that we make mistakes. And sometimes when you make mistakes in service and things don't go right, people get murdered. And you just, you know, you go with the flow. And, um but that's okay. But that's that's been a really big lesson for me to learn because I thought al people were sacred and they never got mean or angry, and that's not true. Um, but that's okay. Um, anyway, so uh, I um, – 20 minutes, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, after uh, – You can talk slower. I can. I, I – I get real excited and I just talk really fast, so I apologize. Um, Y'all have the recording if you want it. Um, ask Latham. Um, but uh, I, um, my my last semester in college, um, a friend of mine was applying for the Fulbright, and um, I'd gotten a chance to travel when I was younger and go to Egypt and Turkey, and I fell in love with Turkey, and so I started um, taking Turkish classes, and I, you know, I was doing really good, but I never had any plans to go back. It just it was something fun. And anyway, my, my friend told me, she's like, you got to apply for this scholarship. You know, um, it's a State Department thing. You'll It's a Fulbright, and um, you'll get to go. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Well, she kept asking me, have you filled out your application yet? Well, no. Well, I'm working on it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. You know, so the night before it's due, she's, drags me to her dorm room and sits me down and basically fills the thing out for me. Um, and, like, we set up I don't know how long and did it. Um, but I didn't want to fill it out because what if they say no? I, I can't take that. Um, and so that's, you know, and she wasn't having it. So, and I thought, well, this isn't going to pan out anyway. So we rushed around the campus and got all the signatures we had to do and um, all of that. And I turned it in and did the interviews and... Um, I remember it was a panel. We walked in, and there's like ten professors in there, and um, I hadn't done as much research as I thought I should have and didn't. And um, you know, they asked me all sorts of questions, and they asked me once about um, women in politics, and I didn't realize they'd had a woman president. And anyway, I answered a question wrong. You know how that goes. And 
well, therefore I'm not getting this. Um, and so I walked out of the interview, called my boyfriend at the time, and I was like, never mind, you don't have to worry, I'm go not going turkey, because I just bombed that interview. Um, and uh, anyway, I graduated, I went home, got crazy little jobs, um, and I was working at a plumbing supply company, because I was in um, a training program to sell bathtubs and showers. And uh, I went home for lunch. My aunt had just um, joked with me like a week before or something. She goes, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen in August. Maybe you'll be in Turkey. And I was like, haha, that's funny. Um, and I really, I, I just kind of let it go because it, it wasn't going to happen. Um, and I go home for lunch and I open the mail and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God. And I read it and my mom's like, what? And I got it and I was jumping up and down screaming. Um, because I kept passing the um, the levels, you know, they send you, in, especially for an interview or something, you get to the next level, next level, and finally it's, oh, well, sorry, we, you know, picked a more qualified candidate. I was waiting on that, because um, in my mind, I was going up against, you know, 4.0 students who, um, you know, capstone men and women and all that, and I was like, they're not going to pick me. Um, yeah, they picked me, so I go back into work, and I can't, I wasn't going to tell them right there, because my boss was gone, and I had this just grin on my face, and the guy's like, what, are you in love or something? I said, I'm going to Turkey. He's like, what? And I said, I'm going to Turkey. He's like, what do you mean? So I told him, and so I've lost, out of all the jobs I've lost, one I lost because I went to Turkey, so I can, I can live with that. Um, so I got fired, like, you know, the, they came to me, and, well, tomorrow's your last day, because we were going to put all this money into you, but, you know, go do whatever. Um, and uh, so I did. I, um, and the night before, well, two weeks before I left, I remember I was so excited, because I love to travel. Um, but I'm also a runner. I don't like dealing with stuff here, so getting on a plane and going to a country, I don't know anybody, sounds better than dealing with my crap here. Just a little craziness. Um, but uh, two weeks before I'm about to go, I'm sitting on the steps of the Hearts Meeting and crying in my sponsor's lap. I'm like, I don't want to go. Um, because I'd, I'd found my Al-Anon home. And um, I just, I didn't know if I could do it without them. Um, because they had just been my rock. Um, you know, I'd come home from work, I'd get something to eat, and it's like an what a gravitational pull, like my car just ended up in that parking lot, and it was just a routine, and I did it constantly, um, and, uh, and so, um, so I got on the plane, and I went, and, um, I just, just so many God things kept happening, the, the first thing on the, I got on one of the plant, the transatlantic flight, and, um, the guy on the other side of the lady, I was talking to her about something, she said, oh, where are you going, and I told her, and he overheard me, and he looks up, he goes, are you a Fulbright, and I said, yeah, he has me too, um, and so we started talking, I had no room when I got there, I didn't realize I was supposed to, you know, book my own lodging, um, I didn't know the language well enough, and I had no idea where I was going, no, no plan whatsoever, I just, I stepped out on faith and trusted it was going to work out, he was fluent in Turkish, he knew the hostel where we were going, I actually, my Turkish teacher had arranged a ride from the airport, so I at least had that part done, um, so, I get with this guy I've never met before, and we find this, you know, really nice guy in a, is a Mercedes or a BMW or something once we get out, and he tells the driver where to go, and I end up having a place to stay, and it all works out. And just everything happened like that, just bam, 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 one after another. And um, I will say it's the hardest year of my life just because um, there there wasn't my traditional Al-Anon had become my, my safe place and my crutch. I kind of, if I needed, I didn't really work through anything until I got, you know, it, you know what I mean? That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, um, so I had, I had to really, really work my program. And, um, so I did the online meeting thing and, um, I finally found there was a Turkish speaking meeting in Ankara. And, um, I went and they, um, they were very leery of me because they were like, how would you find us? I was like, on the Internet. I called a lot of people or emailed a lot of people to find y'all. You're not kicking me out. Um, <laughs> there was this one girl who, um, she spoke enough English for us to communicate, so the women would ask, um, well, who is she and, you know, why is she here? And uh, she would, 
asking. So they needed my qualifier. And so it's like it was very much um, – there was much suspicion. So they asked my name, and, um, and there when they go around the circle, they say, Hi, my name's Megan, and my, um, my alcoholic is my mother. Um, and so I had to qualify myself to them. So I told them, and they're like, in, in the little bit of Turkish I knew, I could all hear them echo, Oh, she's, you know, her mom's an alcoholic, yay! And then after that, I was just accepted. And, um, and so I'd go and sit in these meetings because I... Just out of willingness, I didn't. I didn't know anybody. I couldn't understand anything. the The other girl would translate for me sometimes, but um, they would start the meeting and end the meeting with the the Serenity Prayer in Turkish. And I know about that much of it um, left. But it was it was amazing. Um, just things I could step out on faith and just do. Um, I ended up, um, like I said, there's a really good. Um, English speaking, it's pretty much a unity meeting because it's there's not many people. It's mostly expats, but um, in Istanbul, and um, you know, I met somebody from Canada and um, Sweden, and there was a bunch of us, and you know, we just sit there and have the most awesome program meetings I've ever been in in my life. And then we go out to this little restaurant and have you know dinner, and it was just fantastic. Um, and so it taught me that this is this is absolutely a worldwide program. It is everywhere, um, you know, that you go. And it's also a worldwide disease. It affects everybody. Um, and um, anyway, I ended up, there was a Canadian lady who was in Al-Anon. Um, we ended up starting a meeting in Agra. We meet at the Starbucks every, like, week and have us, you know, have a little meeting. And it was, um, it was just fantastic. So anyway, I, I got through that and came home, and, um, sorry, I don't, I usually don't talk that much about it, but, um, and, uh, I guess it, it'll be five years since I've been home. I feel like I just got home, because I'm sure people are tired of me talking about it, and I try not to talk about it that much, but, um, it just, it was such a part of my life, it's just affected everything I've done. Um, and so, anyway, I came home and started working as a paralegal for a while, and, um, oh, well, I guess I could go back what Alan has done for me. Um, <laughs> my, um, my relationship, yeah, I just came home and started working and, you know, learned that, um, if somebody else is not footing the bill for travel, it's kind of expensive to go, so I hadn't done any more of that, but I want to soon. Um, but anyway, um, I, uh, my relationship with my mother is, um, amazing. Um, she's not in recovery. Um, she's not currently using, but um, I think part of that, they finally got her meds right. So she's um, a couch potato, to be honest. Um, she she doesn't do what I want her to do. There will always be that. Um, but she, I love her, and she loves me, and that's enough today. Um, I go, I made um, kind of a living amends, and I go every week to um, to pick her up and take her to my grandmother's, and we have barbecue. Um, and I've been doing that for probably three years now since I moved to Huntsville. And um, that has been just, just wonderful because before Alan on my, I always had motives for stuff. I always wanted, you know, it wasn't pure. I didn't want to just do it to, you know, love my mom. It, I was trying to get something out of it or change her or something, and um, that's just not there. Um, I do have to practice acceptance a lot of time, and um, sometimes I don't bite my tongue, but um, I've, you know, I've learned if if I say it more than once, I'm probably nagging, and I try not to, um, you know, and it, it's her life. She's she's an adult, and she gets to make her own choices. Um, if I don't agree with those choices, tough nuggies, not my life. Um, she probably doesn't agree with some of my choices, but, you know, um, but most days I can just love her for who she is, and that that's a gift that only Alanon could give me because that was not happening um, if Megan was in charge. Um, you know, and just um, trying to love my family as they are and accept them because they're still sick, and um, last, I guess last Easter, um, a year ago, I got cornered um, by my aunt after after our family thing, and she called me ungrateful and um, gave me this whole lecture and stuff, and I was absolutely heartbroken because 
Don't call an Al Anon ungrateful. Are you kidding me? I mean, I'm, um, anyway, I could go into all that, but, um, I, of course, I, I still have a bit of resentment. Um, I've been trying to let go and trying to love her. Um, but she, when it was over, I just, the whole time I was praying, God, what do I do? God, what do I do? And he said, L give her a hug, tell her you, you love her and say thank you and leave. And that's what I did. And um, I have to realize my family's sick and they're, they've got their own motives for stuff. And they'll never, because that's all I want. I just want to be loved and accepted and them to be proud of me. Um, but due to their their sickness, that can't happen sometimes. And, um, you know, I have to be a big girl and deal with that. But y'all love and accept me and my mom and my grandma love and accept me and that's enough um this this program has really taught me um to how to beat how to find who i am and how to love who i am and that's been um just amazing um i know i keep using that word um but um you know i i have priorities now i don't I don't get sucked into relationships like I did before. Um, sometimes they get a little jealous because I'm a little busy. Um, and it's usually with, you know, Al-Anon stuff. Um, it's not always Al-Anon stuff. I've started doing other things. Um, you know, I train dogs on Saturdays. And I found other ways to do service. Um, and it's stuff that I enjoy and I love it. Um, you know, this weekend I'm going to a roundup. They asked me to be on the board of that a couple years ago. And I've had a ball. Um, I go somewhere my phone doesn't work and I get to see friends I never get to see except there an area and it's just it's it's fabulous. Um, I guess uh, I guess one one last thing I'll tell you um, I uh, one little thing about Sumatanga which this is another way my higher power works but um, I'm, I grew up Methodist and that was the church camp I always went to and the first spiritual experience I can really remember was there um, during a revival kind of thing. And um, and I had no idea there was an Al-Anon Roundup. And this has been years ago. I mean, I was like 11. And um, that was, I guess, the first time I really had a connection with my higher power, um, which, you know, I'd gotten mad at him long ago and decided he didn't think I was worthy or um, of his time. So, you know, I can do this anyway. you got bigger problems. Um, and anyway, when I was in college, I found out there was a, a roundup at Sumatonga, and it's an Al-Anon roundup, which you don't have many of those. Um, but, uh, and so I, I signed up and I went, and, um, i it's helped me find my higher power again. Um, cause there's, there was a reading in here, and I'll just read real quick, um, it says, it's on May 14th. Um, Al-Anon recovery is a discipline that requires diligence, patience, and consistency for the best results. At times we see obvious results from our efforts, while at other times we reach plateaus and feel stuck. If we go on putting one foot in front of the other and continue to work the program, we find that all plateaus eventually come to an end. Just when we reach the end of our patience, a doorway seems to open and we suddenly take a huge leap forward. We see that none of the time that passed was wasted. Although we didn't know it, we were quietly absorbing the program. Most of us find that the results were worth the wait. Today's reminder, whether or not I see immediate benefits, today I choose to keep coming back. And it says, patience is the key to paradise, a Turkish proverb. Um, that's... I heard a lot of people say when I got here, well, I'm grateful for, you know the alcoholic in my life, and I thought, how in the heck can you be grateful for that, you know, we wouldn't have to sit in these meetings if it weren't for that, and um, I, um, I'm i now one of those people that says, I'm grateful for my alcoholic, and the alcoholism in my life, and the bad stuff, and I get those sneers from some people, I'm like, oh. and I think, I want to hug them, to just say, just wait, just keep coming back, um, because I've, I've learned that, um, Everything happens for a reason. Absolutely everything. And um, there's you can find something good in all of it. And that's when I when I can stop and think about that, like lost my job a while ago. And that was really hard, but I kept 
I just kept that faith that y'all have given me that everything was going to be okay. Um, you know, God hadn't dropped me yet. I'm not homeless under a bridge, and if I was, I would be okay. My sponsor <laughs> reminded me y'all weren't going to let me go homeless under a bridge. But, um, you know, just that absolute trust, and I'm not saying I always have it, but it's much more today than it's ever been. Just the trust that no matter what happens, everything's going to be okay. Um, you know, I've... I've gotten to walk through um, the fears I had when I came in here. My biggest fear was my mom dying and um, spiders. Um, I'm still scared of spiders. Um, but uh, I, um, you know, another fear was my grandparents dying because they were the ones who raised me when my mom wasn't well, and they were the ones I always called when something went bad. Um, you know, last year my, my grandfather died, and that... Um, for some reason, I didn't ask for help. I didn't tell my sponsor. I didn't tell any Al-Anon people what was going on. And um, I just kind of was, I guess, in a haze. And um, this is my higher power. When I was at the funeral, um, a lady from my group walked in. She was a friend of his daughter. Um, you know, that's what Al-Anon is. That's what my higher power does for me. When I can't take care of myself, he does for me what I can't. Um, and... When I have that kind of power, power, higher power and this kind of support, there's nothing I can't get through. Um, you know, and, but it's one day at a time. Um, you know, I hit those plateaus and I um, think, well, I don't feel like I'm growing. Um, I kind of thought that on the way here. I'm like, I hadn't really felt real spiritual and, you know, all that right now. What am I going to tell these people about? And it's like, well, I filled up an hour with something, so I hope y'all got something out of that. I love y'all. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Okay. I'm done. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.